Well, good day, everyone. I want to welcome you to an exciting presentation that we have lined up for you tonight. Uh, the presentation is entitled Planting Your Path by Ms. Abra Lee. And before we get going, you know, I just thought about, you know, what was planting your path? And this is, um, you know, it, it's bigger than just one topic. And it's how our whole ecosystem um, thrives and supports itself with other members of itself. And we as that human species can also do that with one another. And so when we think about planting our path in the field of horticulture, it doesn't take just one train of thought or one particular group. It takes all of us to support that field of horticulture. So this is the first presentation and, and exciting way to kick off our fall appeal. And the message of our fall appeal is bridging the nature gap. And we'll do that by getting our presentation going tonight. So I would like to introduce our featured speaker for the evening, Ms. Abra Lee. She is a, na a national speaker, writer, and founder of Conquer the Soil, which is a community dedicated to celebrating the history and beauty of horticulture. She has spent a whole lot of time in the dirt as a municipal arborist, extension agent, airport landscape manager, and much more. Abra is a graduate of Auburn University, College of Agriculture, and alumna of the Longwood Gardens Society of Fellows, which is a global network of public horticulture professionals. It is my esteemed honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Abra Lee. Renee, thank you so much for the warm welcome. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with y'all. Thank you for joining me uh, this evening. And somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see it says planning your path in horticulture. Can y'all? Yay. OK, awesome. So Renee briefly touched on planning our path. And that's going to be different for everyone. And I just want to reassure you, whether your path is horticulture or some other journey in life, it's going to change. It's going to ebb and flow. It's, it really is a roller coaster. Hopefully not a, a, a roller coaster that, that is full of, maybe full of thrills, but not full of defeats. But those happen. They happen to me, and you're going to hear about them tonight. And you know what? You bounce back, you get back up on that pony, okay? So with that being said, I want y'all to know a little bit about me. Renee gave that um, beautiful introduction. It was so warm. Thank you so much. And I, I don't really know that y'all still know me as a person. So my path in horticulture was planted a little bit without me um, not even knowing that, that this was gonna happen to me. So I share this picture here. This is my dad, my late father, Hillier Emily Jr. passed away back in 2018. And when I was a child, he was director of parks for the city of Atlanta. And he was the first black director of parks in Atlanta and worked under Mayor Maynard Jackson, who was uh, the first Black mayor of Atlanta. So that was really influential in my life, even though that's not what I necessarily knew that I was going to do with my life. But I spent my childhood in Atlanta, Georgia, spent it riding around in all these beautiful parks with my dad. So places like Piedmont Park, which is a midtown in the center of the city, and also places like Oakland Cemetery, which is a cemetery, a Victorian cemetery, but also a public park in Atlanta. Now, the other thing about Atlanta culture is that it is a culture that is entrenched in Black culture in America. It is Black Southern culture. And so I grew up in that. And that ended up influencing my path in horticulture. So I share that because the culture of your community can influence you for the better, for the worse, and hopefully for the better. And even if it's not necessarily um, the community that you live in that you love, it may be other communities that really influence you. So don't be scared to, and I hate to use this term because I feel like it's so overused, but don't be scared to lean in to who you are and who I am at the end of the day when you take it all away. Besides being a big time Auburn Tigers fan, I'm a little black girl from the South. And that is who I feel like I answer to every night when I go to bed, that child within me. Now, I talked about growing up in Atlanta, this black metropolis, okay? It's just the, the city that rose from the ashes after the Civil War. Now, even though my dad and, and, and I were hanging out in these Atlanta parks during the weeks, on the weekends, it was my mama who ensured that I never fell too far away 
from my country roots and she took us down to the dirt road country and i mean it was a dirt road to barnesville georgia now if you see the picture on the left it says barnesville buggies barnesville hadn't been popping y'all since the horse and buggy was around they were the buggy capital of a world so that tells you that when i say i'm country we really country and that's the picture of me holding my little easter basket on the left at one of our easter egg hunts down on the family farm and this is how i spent my weekends and it was this where i may have really learned um things about just black culture black power black art black literature black love in atlanta i learned how to be southern down here in barnesville and that's probably the most important, maybe the equally uh, important attribute that I have. So I want to share this picture with you, this collage. And this is really the smokehouse down in Barnesville in the back. And this is my Aunt Lois, my grandmother's sister, who was the matriarch of our family and lived on that farm of ours until I was maybe, let's say, about 2013, 2014, when she passed away. So sadly, no one's there anymore. The land is there, but none of... Um, None of what I'm showing you today is, is still there. It's just kind of grown over. But what is it about Aunt Lois and this farm? It was really, it was there as this constant reminder of my roots. And I show you her plants in the back because she very much had what I say academics call this uh, a vernacular landscape, but I call it a folk garden because it's a garden of the people. So she absolutely would take her old pots and pans and plant them up and have little um, we call these upcycling or recycled things. Now you see the little lamb in the front. She might throw some dirt in that too and make sure that something sprouted up. She did not waste a thing. And that also very much um, stayed with me. And maybe you call that a pack rat. I don't know, but thank God that she was the uh, outdoor pack rat because she taught me so much value in horticulture and um, just an exceptional, an exceptional plants woman that she was. Now, so on to Auburn. I showed up at Auburn University just because I thought it was the next step. I want to be very clear, and I mean this, and I want y'all to hear this very clearly. College is a privilege. It is not a right. I was able to go to Auburn because of my parents having a level of financial privilege that was able to send me there. When I was there, I kind of just took a job for fun. I didn't really have to have the job to support myself or for my family. And so don't ever let um, yourself think that if you don't have this degree or that degree from college, you're not going to make it. That is just not true. It is a real privilege. And if you are, if it's something that's for you, great, but you may decide you're an artisan, you want another trade. And we'll talk about that later. But I ended up at Auburn, got pulled in like everybody else does with the tumors oats and the lemonade and the football stadium. I said, yep, that's where I'm going to go. But when I went there, I went from this real community of love to really kind of not knowing my path in horticulture. And this is a picture of me. It's a grainy picture, but it's really the only one I could find of my classmates. We were out in Colorado on a trip on one of these horticultural competitions. And well, actually this picture's in Wyoming, but we were there to be right next door at Colorado State. And I put this up because there are gonna be times that you're gonna be the only one. And here, it wasn't just me that was the only one. Yes, I'm the only black person in this picture. I'm on the far left. However. Auburn set up, and it's not that this is a right or wrong, but this is a fact. At the time that I was there, it was a place that was a, uh, it really was made for you to succeed if you were part of what is called the good old boys club. And that's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just a thing. And so even though that playbook is what I was taught out of for ornamental horticulture, that wasn't going to be the playbook that worked for me. There are people in this picture that certainly aren't part of that club. So their daddies weren't farmers. They're not growing up, you know, with a granddaddy that's a preacher. That's kind of that club um, that they're in. So there are also people in this picture that may not fit that mold, but that's okay. But the problem was I was trying to assimilate. I was trying to kind of push away my Atlanta, my Barnesville upbringing and just dive in like I'm one of them. But guess what? You're not one of them. You got to be yourself. And once you can do that, you will be able to succeed and overcome anything in life. So you don't have to assimilate. You really can be whoever you are in your heart. So moving on, left Auburn, got a job in commercial landscaping, went to the Parks Department, City of Atlanta. And then I also got my first big break and that was as landscape manager 
at Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport. At the time, it was the world's busiest airport, and I absolutely felt like I was on top of the world. And in this picture here, I'm standing on a hill overlooking the runway, planes taking off, probably top two, one of the best jobs I ever had. And y'all, when I tell you I've had about 12 jobs, I've had them. So it really was a wonderful job. However, even though I was quite successful there, I was also quite young when I was hired. I was only 28 years old. We had put in a floral clock. We were winning awards, but I was feeling imposter syndrome because of my age. I was thinking, well, I'm young and the people around me are adults, you know, 20, 30, 40 years my senior. I don't even know if I'm doing it right. I felt like I was just shooting by the hip, like Yosemite say I'm the cartoon character, like pow, pow, pow. I didn't believe in myself just quite yet, but I should have. I really should have. And I want to share this with you. This is a picture of me and my mama, my sweet mama that lives with me. Uh, she's in the room next door, holding on to her Pomeranian uh, in her uh, shih tzu, because they've heard this speech a million times. They don't want to hear it again tonight. But I was sharing with her, I'm at this airport. I have these employees. I'm the youngest. Again, the only one in the rooms at the time, I was the youngest. And I said, I just don't feel like they really look at me as a leader just yet and my mama took out her notepad now my mama is a, a retired educator she is a trained historian that is what her her work was in history economy uh social science and she wrote this note and i want i'm reading it to you uncle simon and my mother so she was explaining to me i want you to go back and revisit barnesville and really remind yourself who you are and at the bottom it says ga washington what it means is george washington carver is what the second line says, went to Auburn at night and taught the other race there. And so she had pulled out this book that she had, and it talked about, very briefly, George Washington Carver being snuck in at Auburn at night to teach these professors. Now, for those of y'all that don't know, George Washington Carver was at Tuskegee, the, the Wizard of Tuskegee, right? He uh, Tuskegee is literally on the same street as Auburn, 20 miles down the road, make a right, that's Tuskegee. And it never occurred to me, of course, the greatest horticulturist of all time would have been brought to Auburn to influence these professors. However, I had never heard this while I was at Auburn, and it didn't even really occur to me to explore Tuskegee's horticulture, which was right down the road, and it was exceptional. And so that sent me on this journey to reflect on who I was to build my confidence so I would never sit in a room again with imposter syndrome. So what did it remind me of? My mama, I came back from Auburn and I'm thinking I'm knowing things and I'm going back to my Aunt Lois's house who you saw and I'm telling her, oh, that's not a bush, it's a shrub, right? I'm, I'm learning the way you're supposed to talk in horticulture. And my mama had to remind me Look, baby, don't be no educated fool. And what does she mean by that? This is a picture of my great grandfather. This is Sha Few and Maddie Few. My mother's grandparents raised her on that farm. Now, if you look at this license, this is my great grandfather's license. It says his X mark. This was a man who was illiterate, meaning he did not read, he did not write. But this is also a man whose mother was born into slavery and he purchased that 27 acre farm in Barnesville. He cleared that land. He dug that lake. He put those cows in the pasture. He put the fields out there, the agriculture row crops. And he did all of this without being able to read and write. So being an educated fool, who's the real horticulturist in the room? My great grandfather or me, whose parents had the financial privilege to make sure Auburn got all them checks and I passed enough classes to get a degree. And side note, I do wanna tell y'all this cause I'm very open about this when I talk about it is I actually even failed out of Auburn at one point. Now, I'm not saying waste your mama's money and fail school. And I want y'all to pass your test if you're still taking them, whether you're young or an adult. What I'm saying is that it's not the end of the world if you fail. I re-enrolled. I got back in class uh, about six months later. And after then, I was a wonderful student. And I wasn't failing because I was a dummy. I was a person, I'm not a good test taker. I can put together puzzles, but if you give me a black and white test with four choices, it's just not my jam. So again, don't be an educated fool. The people around you can be just as good, if not better than you. And it's not for us to call people's intelligence into question, it's to call it into action. My grandfather, my great-grandfather could read signs. 
So of course he was an exceptional plantsman because he could read plants, the seasons, nature. He was certainly the best in my family. Now, I talked about um, myself not being a great test taker. This is my grandmother, my mom's mother. And I always was an artsy child. I went to art camp. I always liked color and razzle dazzle, as I told um, some of your um, the folks on the call when I first got on. And my mama had to remind me, baby, you are from a family of artisans. Your grandmother and her sisters and your great grandmother, they hand stitched all these quilts. And these are just a few of the quilts behind. And in my house now, I have 20 of these hand stitched, hand cut quilts that these women in my family made. And these are women that even it, as a child, Barnesville had a pot belly stove, y'all, a pot belly, like you had to still stick wood in that thing, set a fire and get to cooking breakfast. And so she was like, you understand luxury. Wealth is not money. Wealth is the love you have around you. Wealth is the things that the people pour into you. Wealth can be the talents that are in your hands. So it's important to have an educated mind and also educated hands when you're in horticulture. And clearly my grandmother and her sisters had quite educated hands. So now I'm feeling good. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm like with it. I'm like, yes, this is who I am. I can do it. I can do anything in life. And I believe that to this day. So I wanna show y'all this picture here. And remember, George Washington Carver was snuck in at night to teach these Auburn professors. Never heard this, sat at that school for five and a half years. I was not a quick student. And so I said, well, what else don't I know? And so I started this journey, which changed my career in horticulture. Now, I was always good with um, a decent, I should say decent with plants. But what I realized I was great at was I was a much better storyteller. And so I shifted, I reinvented my career in horticulture and started doing research in history, Southern garden history and black garden history. And that is what I do to this day. Now, these women that you see here, these are black women in Washington, DC. It's 1870. It is five years after the civil war is over. Um, Emancipation Proclamation has happened, slavery has ended, and these are Black women who came out and to downtown Washington, D.C. on horse and carriage, brought their plants in from their farms in Virginia, and they are here. And these aren't just flower sellers. These are mobile nursery women, y'all. What was they going, Home Depot? I mean, no, people weren't picking up their plants from stores like that back then. They were picking it up from women like this. So when we talk about flower farmers and flower sellers, it never occurred to me that women like me had been doing that role for a very, very, very long time. And thank God somebody had the foresight to sit there and capture them and write down their story and to illustrate this back then. Then there were people like Thomas Queen I found out about from Annapolis, Maryland. He was also born into slavery. And at one time he was a gardener at the governor's mansion there. And one day somebody threw an old geranium out into an ash can, you know, where the ashes are from the fire. And he took that plant and propagated that clipping and boom, he was like, I'm in it. I love this horticulture thing. I'm going to build me a greenhouse. I'm going to ship flowers throughout the state of Maryland. And that is exactly what he did. I know this picture is grainy. It's old, y'all. It was from the 1920s. However, in this picture, he is 86 years old and still making it happen in his greenhouse selling these flowers. So it's never too late. It's never too late to pursue your dreams. Also, I want to point out this ad. This man was successful. He's running ads in the paper, y'all. So success is a, it, it's chestnut checkers, as the saying goes. It's a long game. So Thomas Queen, we all need to be like Thomas Queen, 86 and still getting to the coins, getting his money. Then people like Sylvester Owens. So sometimes you don't realize the community around you is pretty legendary. And my mom's best friend, this is her uncle. This is her grandmother's brother. Sylvester Owen was a black man who was the head of Biltmore Gardens, and he is called the Azalea King in a, a old publication like Ebony Magazine, and that is because he was a plantsman, and he was part of a plant hunters group, and they would go around the south and explore all of the azaleas. Now, he started off as a chauffeur to a gentleman named Chauncey Beetle, the legendary horticulturist from Canada who was at Biltmore, and upon Chauncey Beetle's death, Sylvester Owens was appointed the head horticulturist there, and he worked there for years, went throughout the state of North Carolina, taught a lot of classes. So again, self-taught. Self-taught is always an option, and Sylvester Owens, um, the Azalea King, 
We thank him for it. And I would not have realized how close his story was to my family through my mom's best friend. So sometimes you just got to ask folks questions. You never know. Let them know what you're really interested in and they can share information with you. Now, I shared this picture. This is Ralph Elwood Brock. I'm just looking down to make sure I stay on time. This is Ralph Elwood Brock. This gentleman is the first Black forester in the United States of America. He graduates from the Pennsylvania Forestry Academy, which is now called Penn State Mount Alto. He went to high school in Wilmington, Delaware, was one of 13 students to join that class in forestry that year, and six made it out. And Ralph Elwood Brock is one of the people who made it out. He went on to own his own nursery, do landscape work, and had a very successful career. And he did face tough challenges. He did encounter racism in school. And I want to not um, gloss over any struggles that anyone that I'm showing you today had. But what I do want y'all to understand is that their lives are to be celebrated. And it's not always um, it's not always what we have to do is to reduce someone's life to the, the, the toughest parts. If all people did was talk about my failures, I wouldn't be here with y'all today because guess what? They were just a moment in my life. So Ralph Elwood Brock had an extraordinary career as the first black forester. And I also bring him up because arborist, being an arborist, now I'm not a certified arborist, but to be a certified arborist, you have to have three years working in a board culture in trees or a degree in horticulture, forestry, landscape, architecture. So horticulture, gardening, arboriculture is one of those careers. You don't have to be under the ball and chain of student loan debt. You can absolutely go out and be a certified arborist. Them certified arborists out here getting paid, y'all. Do not let them fool you. And they have good benefits working for these power companies and also wonderful places like arboretums in um, public gardens. Now, this might be the most iconic person that is on here to me. This is the queen, Mrs. Annie May Van Reed, out of Darlington, South Carolina. This woman owned a five acre nursery and greenhouse. Again, no Home Depot, no local garden center. People were coming to Mrs. Annie May Van Reed. She sold plants all up and down the East Coast from the 1920s to the 1960s to her death. Now, why do I love her? Because as I said earlier, I love me some razzle dazzle. Now this is, this is a woman that likes to flex and show off. Okay, first of all, she's wearing a fur coat in South Carolina. It don't even get that cold. That is our neighbor. It, South Carolina is warmer than Georgia, y'all. She's just doing it to show y'all she got money. And I'm not saying that I'm a fur coat lover. I just love how she was like, let me go get my fur coat to take a picture in front of my florist shop just to show y'all. So that's wealth. That's what we want. So yeah, it's nice to have the wealth of your community and nice biscuits and quilts, but it don't hurt to have them pockets looking good too, like Annie Mae Van Reed. Also, her 1940 Ford floral delivery van from her greenhouse, and she is giving us legs, she is giving us a pose, she is letting y'all know I run this town. That's what I'm talking about. You don't have to be running Atlanta, you can be running Darlington, South Carolina, or Louisville, or whatever part of Kentucky that you may be in. So this is why I love Mrs. Annie Mae Van Reed, and real talk, as the kids say, if we equated her wealth to uh, what she was worth when she passed away, which was um, at one point it was like, I think 60 something thousand dollars, that spending power today would be $1.2 million. So she absolutely was essentially a self-made millionaire in her time. And that was my alarm going off, but I'm gonna get through these next few slides and get y'all on your way. So this is Asa Sims. This gentleman was the head of the Hampton University Greenhouse the head of floriculture there. And he also was the state advisor to what became called the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. Now, this is a group that met in Hampton in April 22nd, 1932. And they went on to be a legendary group of women. And I'll show y'all next. But I also want to show y'all, Asa Sims is sitting down at that table. There was no PowerPoint back then. He was using his hands, educated mind, educated hands. He made 3D models that he took out into the community to teach beautification classes. So that may be that may be your method to teach people. You may be more hands-on, more visual, more architectural and structural like Asa Sims, a gentleman who went to Hampton to be an artist and realized I can use flowers and plants to paint my pictures. And that's exactly what he did. And he did beautification work throughout his long and storied career. The lady that you see in the middle is a woman named Ethel Early Clark. And I mentioned the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia. 
And on that day, um, in on April 22nd, 1932, I am not texting y'all. I'm setting off my alarm because I thought it was off and I can still hear it. But on April 22nd, 1932, four people gathered at Hampton, Asa Sims, Ethel Early Clark, William Cooper, and Purvis J. Chesson, and they formed what was called the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. Ethel Early Clark in the middle was the first president of these clubs, and they had three goals, to stimulate interest in gardening, to disseminate information, and to encourage beautification. Now, I keep bringing these women up because April 22nd, 2022 is the, nine, is the 90th anniversary. Let me let me get some water. See, Annie Mae Van Reed talk about her wealth and drive my throat out, I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. But April 22nd. You're fine with time too, Abra. Don't okay. worry. So thank you. <laughs> April 22nd, 2022. April 22nd is Earth Day every year, but it is also the day that these clubs were founded. I love to call it Ethel Day because these women, these seven clubs that were founded in 1932 went on to be thousands of clubs. These women encouraged people to vote. They got out the vote. They demanded that their civic elected officials did things like fix the potholes in their streets. They formed junior clubs. They formed clubs for men. They were the most, I would say, hidden in plain sight horticultural uh, group America has uh, pretty much ignored to this point. So next year, their 90th anniversary, I hope that you remember them. It's not just Earth Day, it is Ethel Day 90. And in 2032, it'll be 100 years to celebrate these women and the thousands of clubs that they influenced, not just in Virginia, but to Georgia, North Carolina, Mississippi, Kentucky, and beyond out to California, the Negro Garden Club of Virginia, the legendary Negro Club, Garden Club of Virginia. Now, this gentleman, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. This is William O. Perry. He was a florist in Miami, and he was part of a, a group that was trying to get into FTD, the Floral Telegraph Delivery Association. He wanted to get his flowers shipped across America. FTD wasn't having it. They said, you're a Black guy. We're going to pass. So what did William O. Perry do? He decided, I'm going to dress up as a waiter, and I am going to go to the FTD convention, and I am going to take all the notes and I'm gonna come back and form my own organization and call it the International Florist Association so that black people can ship their flowers, black florists, black business people can ship their flowers across America with no problem. And that is exactly what he did. Now I'm not saying go crash somebody's party and put on a suit and pretend to be a waiter, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. So yeah, sometimes when you're sitting in those rooms and you may be the only one Sometimes that is a real blessing to you because people can see right through you and they think, oh, they're not listening. They're invisible. That's when you take all the notes. Yes, I took the notes of the good old boy playbook and look at me now, right? I use it, but I use it on my terms. So do like William O. Perry did and just be smart about it. Be creative. And here he is sitting at a table with uh, some members from the association. Now, what's important about this group is that they went on for decades like this. And in 1957, from Louisville, Kentucky, Murray B. and Mary Alice Kinslow from the Kinslow Flower Shop won the best floral trophy at the 1956 International Flowers Convention in Cleveland. So y'all got some homework because I have been searching for their picture for quite a long time and I've never found it, but it's only so many Kinslows running around Kentucky, let alone Louisville, K-I-N-S-L-O-W. So I would love to see what they look like because they didn't just own a flower shop, they owned greenhouses. This woman and her husband had a nursery and that's a really big deal. So we want to make sure that that is recorded and their legacy is remembered. And this is a group of uh, a group picture of the International Florist Association, just a small snapshot of them looking fabulous, fabulous like Mrs. Eddie Mae Van Reed. And this is uh, William O. Perry receiving award from the Carnation Association down on the bottom right. Now. I want to wrap up by giving y'all a few other options. Number one, I'm, I, I'm still in the plant game, but I'm not necessarily hands on with the plants. I, I confess, I don't even have a house plant, but what I do is that I have horticultural stories. So there's other ways to horticulture. There's other ways to forestry. This is a writer. This is Effie Lee Newsom, a Harlem Renaissance writer. And she was what was called an eco poet, a nature writer, a birder, an artist. And her claim to fame is that she wrote a book of poetry called Gladiola Garden, which was the first book of nature poetry, especially written for Black children. Now, this is her most famous poem. 
and I'll let y'all read it. But essentially what she did is that she understood that children are children and she wanted to work on race relations. And she uses brown skin of the, the black children and compares it to oak trees, compares it to the very land. And she ends her poem by saying, I thank God that I am brown for brown has mighty things to do. And so these children that weren't seeing themselves in nature, all of a sudden they were thanks to people like Effie Lee Newsom. Her poetry is incredible. And she also certainly inspires me as a writer. So even if you're not going to be out there digging a whole lot in the dirt, you can also use that to articulate your thoughts as well. Art, this is a gentleman named Charles William Costello. Charles Costello. He is at Ohio State University. And in the mid 1940s, he was had some of his art hanging up, essentially, which is a, a boys and girls club at Columbus, Ohio. And one of the Ohio State professors saw that art. And he ended up being an entomological artist, entomological artist, an insect artist for the Ohio State University in the mid 1940s. This is him drawing out one of his charts. And this is one of his charts on the right. And Ohio State still has many of his drawings. He drew thousands, thousands of insect charts, thousands of zoological charts for these students. So when I majored in horticulture, I had to take entomology. And by the end, I guess PowerPoint was around. I'm old, but I'm, I kind of remember like the early days <laughs> of PowerPoint. And this man hand drew all the pictures that people later came up to blow up under a microscope. So exceptional work that you can do. And I didn't even know you could grow up and be an entomological artist, but you can. You can create the career that you want. And this was a gentleman who was deeply interested in insects. He had been since he was a child and look at his art today. And finally, I wanna end on one more Kentucky person. Now this woman is not from Kentucky. This is Lucille Kane. She was a black florist in Harlem, New York. And this picture was taken at the Metropolitan Florist Association where she won most original for her floral hat. This is 300 baby orchids and 15 Hawaiian orchids atop her head. But the gentleman who took this picture, Mr. G. Marshall Wilson, was a famed photographer for Ebony Magazine. And he captured Black history throughout the decades. And I think he just passed away last year in October. He was from Covington, Kentucky. And I just wrote it down. I want to make sure I got that right. Covington, almost up there by Cincinnati, I think. Yeah, but the point is this, you can also be a landscape photographer. You can do that. Now he didn't just capture only floriculture and landscapes. He captured Langston Hughes. He captured Martin Luther King. He, anybody who was anybody in black American history in the 20th century is who he captured. But this is also, there's room for you. There is space for this. This is creativity. He had the foresight as a photographer to say, boom, let me capture Lucille Kane in her element. So Kentucky, y'all really are out here represented and there's so much more to share. So I wanna thank y'all. I apologize, Kenyatta. Kenny, I know that that is your preferred name to go by uh, for being a little bit over, about four minutes over, but I wanna thank y'all for your time tonight. And now I want to give you the warm introduction that Renee gave to me. So ladies, gentlemen, friends, family here today, I want to introduce Kenyetta Kenny Johnson, who is the Bernheim ambassador. She made the news in Kentucky for this position, y'all. She's, she's a celebrity. Y'all got a celebrity in your building tonight. And her work encourages and inspires young people and a, young adults to consider careers in horticulture, nature, education, and other green jobs. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I am going to pass this over to Kenny. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Good evening. Hey. All right. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say thank you, Abra. I always like when you talk and present. That storytelling element is really, really nice. Um, and then I'll give you guys a brief description of kind of what I do as a Bernheim ambassador. So as the Bernheim ambassador, I really focus on diversity, inclusion, and outreach. And I work on trying to connect different communities from West Louisville, South Louisville, and downtown to nature and whatever means that they feel that that's necessary. So for example, 
We're trying to get pollinator gardens potentially in the West End in each community. Um, but then we're also trying to get different middle school and high schoolers to Bernheim. So from like um, Justice Liu with the, um, excuse me, uh, W.E. Du Bois Middle School and things of that nature, but also trying to just learn the ways of different Bernheim positions so that I can expose other communities and young adults to what Bernheim has to offer. And so that's kind of like a brief description of kind of what I do at Bernheim. Um, but I did wanna ask some follow-up questions to Abra about the presentation. Alrighty. So I know you mentioned that as a, like someone who's different in a space, it's not necessarily like a challenge of intelligence, but how you can bring that intelligence into action. So when you were going to Auburn and then when you worked at the airport, when did you feel that like your actions and your, um, like your work was really impactful, not because of like the diversity and the difference that you brought, but just simply, I guess, like what you had learned from your experiences or do you feel like they are synonymous and to separate the two would like remove some factor of it? Muted. I, I thought I was off. I'm so sorry, y'all. But um, it took me to really and wholly accept who I am before I thought my work was impactful. Because for me, my first job in horticulture was when I was 20 at the Auburn University greenhouses. And I've been in this career for, um, no, I'm, I'm sorry, it was in the year 2000. It was in the year 2000 at the Auburn greenhouses. And I say that to say, I never got to I feel like I got to be a plant mom and all these cool ways that you see people interacting with nature now. It was always a business for me. Plants always meant they have to be alive. They have to be pretty. They have to be a certain way because that is how I was earning my paycheck. And that wasn't sustainable. It was almost like, I was like, I, it's got to be something more, more connecting for me. And me exploring, deeply exploring my roots and seeing where I came from and seeing how those people that came before me just created magical things through horticulture. That's when I started getting my swagger. And that is what built my confidence. And don't confuse that with ego. It just made me believe that every room I should be in. So at the airport, that was ageism. I was the young one in the room and I felt like an imposter. But now I don't feel that way anymore. And it's not because I'm older, it's because I believe in, in what's in me. And I know it sounds very Wizard of Oz, like believe in yourself, like the Gretna the Good Witch says, but that is what I think shifted my career. And that can happen at any time. I didn't have to wait until I was in my thirties for that moment to happen. I wish it had happened at 18. I wish it had happened sooner, but I think the important thing is just to make sure that it happens and to make sure that you know you have something to offer the world that you can live in your purpose. Thanks. I do want to ask a follow up question to that. So for those who don't have the resources or time or for those who haven't put in that energy and work to learn their history and, you know, work with their identity, what would you suggest to kind of combat the imposter syndrome, especially for people of color in the green and environmental field? I think you have to figure out what you want to be good at. So you may want to be a great bonsai artist. Um, or bonsai, I guess is the appropriate word, the, the, the plants that are um, out of Japan. So that means you need to immerse yourself in that culture. And that's not cultural appropriation as much as it is appreciation for that culture and how they use their plants. And so just become where you're the best at it. I just, I nerd out on history. That is my jam. That is what I do. And I know that I am, I'm not the only one that does it. I'm not the best that does it, but I know I'm very good at doing it. And so I choose to do it. So let's say that I was, who knows, five years from now, I may feel like I want to be uh, the queen of bonsai in Atlanta, Georgia. And if I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna study it from the beginning and I'm gonna study it to the end and I'm just gonna immerse myself in it. And I think that's just what you have to do. You don't have to be great at all things. You can be really great at one thing, but if you are the best and you have that confidence, that can carry you and you're gonna people are gonna see that when you walk in a the room they're gonna feel it and they're gonna believe what you're saying so you don't have to look at people who have we're not beyonce y'all she's got a thousand talents pick one we're basic she's 
exceptional, right? So just pick that one thing you're going to be great at. And and I, I want to hear say this very clearly and slow it, slow so everybody can hear it. I remember this old school player was like, I'm going to tell it to you slow so I don't have to tell you no more. So let me tell this to y'all very slow. You can be self-taught and be exceptional at what you do. I am a self-taught historian. Auburn didn't teach me anything. All that money my parents sent down there, I didn't learn anything I showed y'all tonight. So you absolutely can be self-taught and be good at that. And there is nothing wrong with that at all. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I would like to open up questions to um, Jade, Aliana, Debbie, and I feel like that's all we have left of the UCC group. If you guys have any questions. We have two questions. Um, so for Ms. Avery Lee, what made you choose Auburn University instead of Tuskegee? What made you choose a PWI when you could have went to the illustrious Tuskegee University and got that historical aspect as well? That is a, a very good question. And I think about that often. And I believe that my research in history help me uncover that answer. So my parents went to HBCUs, but my parents went to Morehouse, Spelman, um, and Payne College in Augusta, Georgia. And one of the things that I realized, and if you notice my stories, or you, you didn't notice that tonight, but I'll tell you, they stop around 1968. And I do that for a very specific reason. I'm slowly moving into the 70s. But all those people I showed you grew up during the Jim Crow era, and they grew up during the time of segregation. And in 1968, around that time, the Civil Rights Bill is passed. So Black children who could have gone to Tuskegee, 90% of Black children were going to these HBCUs. But once that Civil Rights Act passed, you see 90% of Black children going to these PWIs. So instead of being in communities that were calling their intelligence into action, surrounded by their own people, they ended up in communities that were calling their intelligence into question. So... I think about that and I just think about how I made that choice. And when I applied to colleges, I really, I gotta tell you, I was I was kind of going about it a really dumb way. I grew up watching football on the weekends with my daddy and I thought college meant Georgia, University of Tennessee, Auburn. I thought it meant SEC lineup on Saturday. It just didn't even occur to me to Tuskegee. Now my brother, went to Howard University. My sister went to a, a, a predominantly white school in Virginia called Washington and Lee. But it is also, it's a lot of factors that push people. And now you're seeing a reverse. You're seeing black children embrace what they call the Black Ivy League again. So I do often wonder how my journey would have been different if I had gone to a Tuskegee. But this journey allows me to share both sides of this story and show how important it is to have a community around you, whatever your community is that understands you because they're gonna bring out the best in you and they're gonna call your intelligence into action. And if my professors, they have the one, most of them are retired. They have no idea what I'm doing now. They would have never believed I would be this person because looking at my grades, they would have called my intelligence into question versus action if I had gone to a Tuskegee. So I hope that answers your question. Um, thank but you. thank you for asking it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I have a, uh, another question. So like, because um, I imagine a lot of these stories were kind of hard to find. Um, so what, what was your process for starting to search for these stories? My process was good old fashioned books. So when my mama, and I wish I could remember the book she pulled out that story about George Washington Carver, it's in her house somewhere. I could find it again one day, but everything, ain't on Google. So a perfect example, if you Google Effie Lee Newsom right now, you're going to see a Black woman. And she actually is a Black poet named Effie. I think it's Effie Graham. And I even believe she's from Kentucky. But that's not Effie Lee Newsom. Effie Lee Newsom, the reason I know what she looks like is because I saw her real picture in an old book. And it was talking about her family. And it referenced how she was from this family um, that was, and she was born in Philadelphia. And so the computer will sometimes throw you off. And another thing I want to um, also put y'all on some game, talk to the elders. They have stories. These folks that are of a big age, 
they know things. And I think about my Aunt Lois who passed away in 2013, 2014. Her grandmother lived at her one time, at one time, at one point for years. Her grandmother was born into slavery. It never occurred to me to ask my Aunt Lois, what did your grandmama say about this? That's, that like blows my mind that I just never thought to ask her that. And I'm not saying I wanted to bring up a painful past. It's just, I never said to Aunt Lois, what was the 1940s like? You see what I mean? I had that opportunity and that opportunity is still there. And the third thing I want to say is that um, archives. So going in places like the Atlanta University Center archives. So I have tried to right my wrongs in the, S I mean, the HBCU field. I go right down to that Atlanta University Center where Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, Atlanta are, and I'll go through their archives. But I want to tell y'all this. Archives, the research I do, that's also privilege. And I think that's the bigger conversation we need to have. The archives are open nine to five, Monday through Friday. So if you're working or not working for yourself, you're going to have to take off work to go down to the archives. And before you go to the archives, you got to fill out forms. You got to have a computer to scan it back. You see what I mean? There are so many obstacles to do. So don't let people make y'all think it's just easy peasy. It is really about time and access and privilege to do a lot of these things. And you can create it for yourself. I just want to give y'all the backstory on that because I was just thinking I was just going to roll in and do it. And it shocks me at how slow the process has been. What I've told y'all, that's taken me 10 years to go through because I had a real job. I'm just now to the point I can go down to some archives on a random Friday. And even then, I'm still a caregiver for my mom, which is a whole other story. So it's, it's work, but to me, it's worth the work. So if you're going to be in self-taught in something, you're going to work extra and you're going to work a little bit harder, but that's going to make you more of a subject matter expert. Auburn gave me a playbook. I created my own playbook with my history research. You see what I mean? I connected the dots for myself. And that's why I, I feel like, you know, you can do it yourself as well, whatever you choose to pursue. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I also want to open it up uh, this time to questions from anybody else that I, that I have for Abra or for Kenny, um, if anyone else. Kristen? Um, yeah, I'd like to. Hi, I'm Kristen. I'm director of education at Bernheim, and I have the honor of Kenny being my colleague. And I'm so glad that you're here. I love the article about you in the New York Times um, a, a couple of weeks. And uh, there were a lot of things that I really loved what you said. I took down some notes. I, lo I loved your, your comment about the, and the images of, of uh, the folk garden. I thought that was really fantastic. I have a friend in Los Angeles who does similar work with uh, Latinx communities. He kind of mm -hmm. pioneered the concept of Latino urbanism. Um, and I, I, I think that's such an interesting subject. If you were to go back to those images now that you remember, as a kid, how would you see them differently from how you saw them then? You know, these very familiar landscapes from when you were growing up. What, what might you see now based on all of your research that you wouldn't have thought of in that time and space? I would have asked my Aunt Lois more questions on why she did what she did. Because in these folk gardens, at this point, and they're really few and far between. They're really a, 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 a non-renewable resource at this point. Either people are doing them or they're not. And what we now know through research is that there were a lot of painted tires in those gardens. I saw that, or wheels. And those were symbols that actually meant something to people. So in Black mm -hmm. gardens, in these Black folk gardens, the wheel was pretty much representative of a circle, like the circle of life. Um, coming from West Africa, those old pots and pans you saw, those would have been what we now know are experienced objects in the landscape. An ancestor of hers might have used those, and they're still a part of your life. And so you're, you're using their objects in the garden. And it could have just been she was copying what she saw her mama do and her grandmama do. So I wish I had asked more questions about her thought process. And then also just the understanding of just because Auburn taught me the right way, there's not just one right way. People are oftentimes designing for their pleasure, not for yours. And I'm I'm I, at school, I'm being taught to design for other people's pleasure. So I think just allowing that space and grace to allow people to personalize their gardens. And if you don't like it, you're not a hater. Everybody's not going to like folk gardens, but that doesn't make them wrong. So mm -hmm. I really just would have asked her more questions about why she did what she did, because those stories would have really been priceless. Mm -hmm. And now I don't have an opportunity to ask. Mm. That's, that's a good lesson, I hope, for mm -hmm. some of 
UCC students to to look around at your and ask questions of these things while the the living resources are still available. I don't know if you noticed. I put it in the chat. I found the obituary for Mr. Kinslow from the 1960s. I, I did. I, <laughs> I sent you a direct message. Thank you. So that's <laughs> wonderful. But um, thank you so much for that, and thank you for your question as well. Uh, Cadell and Solome, I saw you raised your hand. Yeah, Salome has a question. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> She's shy. Why were um some of the um people like not named or called aunt or uncle? Why were some of the name people named or not called aunt or uncle? So I didn't show y'all a picture, but if you I think if you go on Google and you type in Aunt Phoebe, A-U-N-T Phoebe, the Magnolia Plantation, you will see a black woman holding a broom, a swept yard, this tool, and she's at Magnolia Plantation Gardens in Charleston, South Carolina. So black people during that time, this is Jim Crow era, turn of the 20th century, late 1900s, early 1800s, and even into the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, if they were an elder, Solome, they were not called Mr. or Mrs. or Madam, like their white counterparts would have been. And what you saw white people specifically in the South do was refer to them as Aunt Phoebe or Uncle Frazier at Magnolia. Or you'll see a more um, prominent example in Aunt Jemima or Uncle Ben. So that is not an honorific title. That's not like how you see Uncle Snoop or something like that with Martha Stewart now, right? And I know you're a little bit young, but y'all know what I mean, the adults in the room. But I do want to be clear, to call somebody ain't or aunt, there are times where that is loving and honorific, but in Aunt Phoebe's case, it was not. And so I'm very much an advocate to revisit and not only say, let's not call her Aunt Phoebe, let's call her Miss Phoebe, and also to acknowledge even the, the look, the attire she's wearing. So if you Google her picture, she's wearing what was very much a servant attire back in her day. And so it's hard for people to look at her as an expert plants woman, they just look at her as a little old black lady and, and sometimes dismiss her knowledge because of her physical appearance. And I also want to tell you this as well, because it's such a rich question. Colorism comes into play. So somebody like an Aunt Phoebe, who we're calling Aunt, and she ain't our auntie, and we're using that as a non-honorific term, this was also a dark-skinned black woman. And I am a noticeably a brown black woman. But when you saw the picture of Sylvester Owen, he's a very fair skinned man. And it was easy for him to travel and do things. And I'm not saying his life was easy, but people look at him as a plantsman in a way that they don't with Aunt Phoebe. So there's a lot of nuance and context to the way history and people are read. And we have to strip away all those things to understand why we call people what we call them. And is that the right title to call them? Because they very much may be subject matter experts. So I know that was a long answer, darling, but I hope it answered your question. <laughs> I hope you didn't go to sleep on me. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Renee and Claude? Oh, I'll, I'll let Claude go first. Please, Claude. Oh, I would rather you go first. Um, I'll, okay. So um, I have a home in the panhandle of Florida, so deep south. Um, and um, I love vernacular gardens of the Deep South, especially Black vernacular gardens. Have you ever run across bottle trees? Oh, Do you know what I'm? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, um, I've become fascinated with them. So do it. You got to just go all in and and research it. Um, Felder Rushing wrote a great book on them. You probably have read that book. Um, and there is many schools of thoughts on that, that the bottle trees were there to capture evil spirits um, and hold on to that Southern culture. We need that. It's Now people just do it because they think it's cute. Again, the tradition has been lost, but understand why you're doing it and why people did it and, and put your spin on it as well. So it's nothing wrong with holding on to your Southern culture, um, especially in, in, in the panhandle of Florida. So encourage it. Go for it. Hey, um, so 
what's in the works for you now? Are you working on any big projects? What can we expect next? Yes, I am. Um, I'm so depressed. I got so much work to do, y'all. It's so hard to be an adult. <laughs> I'm laughing to keep from crying, but it's all good. But really, all seriousness, Renee, I am working on a book called Conquer the Soil, which is the untold story of Black America's um, gardeners, farmers, and growers. And also, I do consulting work with many public gardens, so places like the New York Botanic Garden, the United States Botanical Garden. Um, I do speaking engagements. I write for publications. One of your colleagues mentioned I had an essay that came out a few weeks ago in the New York Times I was really proud of. And my number one big job is that I'm a caregiver for my mom, a full-time caregiver for my 80-year-old mom. So um, that keeps me on my toes and keeps me really busy. But I think just finishing up this book, I just want it to end at this point. I, I'm, I'm so ready for this to be over with. And I still got a little bit more writing to go. Anybody else before we wrap it up? I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you uh, for putting up this presentation. Listening to you talk like made me go back in time and just like imagining people's lives. Like you have, a, like, I just love listening to you talk about everything. That was just awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. I appreciate that. Well, thank you everybody for participating and special thanks to Abra and to Kenyana for um, helping us be part of this uh, part of this conversation and presentation. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that this is part of our Bridging the Nature Gap um, Zoom presentations. We'll have a couple other series. So if you are interested in learning more and joining us for some other, you can visit us at www.bernheim.org slash bridge. So, Again, thank you so much for joining and hopefully we'll see you soon.